Do you have a desire for something more in your Christian walk? Do you have a hunger for the deeper things of our God, whose name is Yahweh in Hebrew? Be encouraged, be inspired, be informed as you search out the truth. As it relates to the Christian and Hebrew history of our faith in Jesus, whose name is Yeshua in Hebrew, Dr. Larry J. Pratt and Rabbi Paul Todd will share the scriptures in our Bible that God said are forever and apply to all Christian believers. These scriptures will reveal the constitution and nature of the soon coming kingdom of Yeshua when he rules as our king on earth. In Matthew 25, there are 10 virgins who are called the bride of Jesus Christ and they are righteous, but only five have enough oil. And what did Yeshua, Paul, and others intend for Christians to do when they said, follow me? Is this a reference to the bride of Christ? Get your coffee, get comfortable, and hear a right now word of God of how Torah, or God's teaching and instruction, is to be written upon our hearts. This biblical wisdom will illuminate our Christian walk and help us to be the salt and light. That is forever and has never changed. Learn the blessing prayers of Yahweh over his bride and our children and our grandchildren for greater blessing, such as protection, healing, revelation, and answers to many questions. Welcome to Yeshua Sabbath Church, everybody. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yay. And it's to SoundCloud people and also Charter Cable Channel 192 on Sunday morning at 945. So good to see everybody. The Sabbath is a covenant sign between Yahweh and his people. This is biblical fact. You cannot avoid it, work around it, or anything. It's what he said. It's what he wants. Yes. So, all right, we're here. We are here at his invitation. So if you'll bow for prayer, please. Avenu Melkenu, our Father, our King, we praise your set-apart name, Yahweh. Thank you for this beautiful Shabbat day. It's a gorgeous day out there today. May you be pleased with our presence, with our praise and our worship, which we just had, with our teaching that we're about to have, and with everything about us. May you be pleased with those that are watching online, and may you touch their hearts and their minds. We thank you so much for your son, Yeshua, that you gave him to us as the one and only way to you. And we thank you that it is only one way. We say we pray always in Yeshua's name. Amen. Our opening reading is from Yeshayahu, Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. If you hold back your foot on Shabbat from pursuing your own interests on my set-apart day, if you call Shabbat a delight, Yahweh's set-apart day worth honoring, then honor it by not doing your usual things or pursuing your interests or speaking about them. If you do, you will find delight in Yahweh. I will make you ride on the heights of the land and feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Yaakov. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Shofar blessing. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and calls us to hear the voice of the shofar. Amen. Blessing of Messiah. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen.
Would you please stand for the Shema? Wherever you are in the world, would you pl please face Jerusalem at the very least in your heart? Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Here, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Did you know we have scripture readings this week? Good. Okay. The Torah reading, we're starting a whole new book, Shemot. Y'all say Exodus, but it's really Shemot, because the first significant word is Shemot. <laughs> means names. And that's Exodus 1 to the first verse of Exodus 6. The Haftarah, a little complicated, it's Isaiah 27, 6 through 28, 13, and 29, tw verses 22 and 23, and Jeremiah 1 through 2, chapter 2, verse 3. Did I get that right? Yeah. The Brit Hadashah is Acts 7, verses 17 through 29. We have a message from Rav Boats. We're gonna, we have started in our The Kingdom of Heaven series of messages. I have no idea how long this was going to last. I was going to keep it to maybe 12 weeks, but I don't think that's going to work. So we're going to talk about some kingdom fundamentals. These are important things for us to know. They are out of the book. I'm looking in the book, for, or in our scriptures, our Bible, for the answers, and not in other literature. I don't care what the commentaries say by either the Jews or the church. I want to find what the book says. Yahweh, open our eyes that we might see wonders from your word. Now, in this series about the kingdom, the Bible is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how to live in it right now while you are here. That's important for us to know. It's a very important concept to realize. Okay, I want to clarify a couple of things. Terminology is one of those things that nails us pretty bad. The kingdom of God is the same thing as the reign of Elohim, depending on whose Bible you're reading it from. They're going to call it different words, but it's the same. The kingdom of heaven is the same as the reign of the heavens. The way of Yahweh, or the way of God, is the same thing. All of those six things are the same thing. It's the kingdom of God. We're go and go look those words up. Because you're going to find in certain Bibles or in certain books, for example, Matthew, you're going to see this same thing talked about one way, and in other books it's talked about another way. All right, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of the heavens, the kingdom of God, is actually a type of government. I chose to leave out all of the long, complicated man-made things about what a government is, but it is a type of a government. It will have a leader. Yahweh made a covenant with one man and his seed. Seed, singular word, zerah. 
that's the government. He's it. And this is his choices, you understand. We can decide to do anything we want, but he doesn't have to listen to us at all. He made the decision. Yahweh chose this one man, Avraham, and as far as I can see, just pretty much for this one reason. He believed in Yahweh, and Yahweh reckoned it to him for righteousness. That was it. Now, we don't know if he went off and asked a whole lot of other people. I mean, there's some people are alluding to that in, in some of the commentaries. We don't know. But we do know that he asked this one man, and this one man said, yes, I will do it. We owe the kingdom of heaven to the faithfulness and obedience of Avraham. Without that obedience part, we would not have, well, we wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have Yeshua, for, for example. And we live in the covenant between Yahweh and Avraham, and I forgot to write into this, and his seed. Anything outside of this covenant with Yahweh is not the kingdom of heaven. So it fits carefully and precisely in an order. Yahweh is an Elohim of order. The covenant promise passed from Isaac or from Abraham to his son Isaac, not the other son, and then to Jacob, and then from Jacob to 12 sons. Now that's out of Scripture. It says Jacob had 12 sons. Now we just finished reading about Joseph's sons being adopted and so on, and then you go, it still works out to 12, not one. Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. So when you say you're of the tribe of Issachar, you came out of the family of Issachar. Simple? The covenant promise, covenant, we go back to the covenant promise, is the kingdom of Elohim. It is the kingdom of heaven. It is the kingdom of God. It is the reign of the, of the heavenlies. It is the way of Yahweh. It is the covenant promise. And it carries several times where it is modified but never abolished. It's never changed. It's simply modified. We had a message on kingdom or on covenant way long time ago and probably have to do that again. The kingdom of heaven is the spiritual kingdom of Yahweh. It's a spiritual thing. The kingdom of heaven on earth is an extension of his reign in the heavens on earth. He does not physically reign here by sitting in a throne someplace here on earth. He has a really nice throne up there. So somebody has to sit down here. A temporary ruler of this kingdom was Joseph. He acted as a kind of a king because he was over Egypt. He took care of Egypt to make sure that they wouldn't starve. And Jacob and all, everybody else came down to Egypt and he basically ruled over them. It was a temporary position and didn't really fill any kind of an issue in the, or anything in the covenant relationship Yahweh made. But he ruled with the... How do I say that? Okay, he ruled as though Yahweh was ruling through him. And we already, we've already read, we've already talked about what took place with Joseph. The permanent ruler of the earthly kingdom of Elohim was to be Judah and his seed. This is kind of important. So in Genesis, when there, there's this big thing right at the end of Genesis, chapter 49, you know, and there's a whole bunch of discussion about Jacob, i.e. Israel, blessing all of the sons. Well, one of them guys was was uh, Judah, and he said, The scepter shall not turn aside from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. 
and to him is the obedience of peoples. Now, there's hidden meaning in that. We, pastor talked about it the other day or, or the other week. There's hidden meaning in there. There's a lawgiver. Lawgiver. Look up the word lawgiver. Find it in the scriptures. Hint, James. Shiloh is Mashiach. They understood that. It's another word, another name for the Messiah. The future king of Israel must come from the seed of Judah, not one of the other guys. That's the way Yahweh said it was supposed to be. That's the end of the entire story. There is no further discussion. It will be somebody that's a Judahite. King David personified the true, honest king of Israel simply because he was a man after Yahweh's own heart. Why did Yahweh pick Abraham? Because he believed him. Why did he pick David? He certainly wasn't some super guy. He was just man after Yahweh's heart. This was good stuff. It's something we should try to emulate, you know, sort of. A lot. Yahweh continues the covenant he made with Abraham in David. David reigned over 12 distinct tribes of people. He reigned over the seed of Israel. That was the third covenant Yahweh made with his people Israel. The second one was the Mosaic covenant covenant. The covenant is made specifically with David, assuring him. Now, this is the Davidic covenant. Really, there's not a whole lot except your seed will sit on the throne of Israel forever. It won't be transferred to somebody else. It certainly isn't going to get transferred to another place on the planet. Sorry, it don't work that way. It goes right to that place in Jerusalem. And they will continuously reign. Now, the last of David's descendants who will sit upon the throne of the kingdom will rule over a united Israel. The only way you can have restoration is you must restore it back to an original condition. In David's day, he ruled over 12 tribes. He passed that on to Solomon, his son, who ruled over 12 tribes until he got Whatever, he got carried away there. But he will, the, the future king will rule over both houses, Ephraim and Judah, and that will be restored by da, 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 Messiah himself. <coughs> David's son Solomon, uh, he just didn't keep God's law. That, that, was, that was it. He was trying for a while, but then he got off on other things, you know, he, well, how many wives was it? 700? you got to be kidding me. No way. Anyway, Solomon's sons, they decide, well, we're going to do this and we're going to mess everything up. And they certainly did. Ten of the tribes split off from the, the whole of Israel, went up north, and they did their own thing. They threw out Yahweh's rules. Yahweh's commandments, and even the covenant. And they chose to do things that were not right. They are, or they became, Ephraim Israel or Israel. Those are the two, two terms you're going to find, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then elsewhere in the, in the prophets. That's those guys, the ten guys. And then... Ephraim, Israel, separated themselves from Yahweh, and he sent them into exile. And they lost everything, and they lost big time. They lost him. But there's a remnant within that. Now, they, he really knew what he was doing. you got to understand, Yahweh's smart. All right, now, he knew what he was doing, so by sending those, those bunches of people off and scattering them all over the world, they eventually turned all over the world 
into Ephraimites. There ain't no way you can tell whether in your blood you are not an Ephraimite, i.e. part of the ten tribes of Israel, or not. You cannot find out. And you're out there. And Yahweh is going to call to that little teeny thing in your DNA or your whatever, your genes or some kind of thing like that. He's calling to that now. The remaining two tribes and Levi became Judah Israel. And they more or less followed Yahweh's commands. Now these guys think they're pretty smart and they're pretty cool and we got it together. Well, now, why is it that Judah was sent into captivity for 70 years in a Babylon? They kind of didn't quite have it together. So neither tribe, neither group of people can say, we're it, man. No, it ain't going to work. <coughs> the scepter of leadership was supposed to remain with Judah. The king of Israel was supposed to be of the tribe of Judah. Those are biblical facts. They are the way they are. And this is where we find it in that one little verse there in Genesis 49.10. We come back to the same thing. The scepter stays with the tribe of Judah. Judah failed again by nullifying the commands of Yahweh through their traditions. That's kind of paraphrasing what Yeshua said. The traditions of Judah became a Torah to them. Now the church is sitting there right now and saying, ah, we didn't do that. Yeah, they did exactly the same thing. The church nullified the Torah and replaced it with their traditions. Both groups mess things up. Yeshua came to earth to teach Torah correctly. Fact. This is what the Jews believed in his day. The people of Judah believed factually that the man was going to come, if he was going to be Messiah, he was going to come and teach Torah properly and correctly. That's why he can be called the Messiah. There's other things that he came to do, but that's one of them. He is of the tribe of Judah. He's qualified to be who he is because he is of the tribe of Judah. Yeshua receives the scepter of leadership from Yahweh. In Matthew 28, 18, he says, Yeshua came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All have, in Matthew eleven seven twenty seven, all have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and He to whom the Son wishes to reveal Him. Yeshua revealed to the people that He wanted to reveal who He was, and who the Father is. We see this today. You aren't sitting here or there on YouTube if Yahweh didn't call you to do this. Now, some are sitting there and they're saying, I don't have to believe any of this. Well, okay. But guess what? That's going to stick with you. And it's not going to go away. It will stick with you for a long time. And someday you will wake up. Uh, hopefully. Anyway. In John 3.35, the Father loves the Son and has given all into His hand. In John 17, this is Yeshua's prayer. Read John 17. There's good things. This is where you, Yeshua says, I gave them your name. And if I'm not mistaken, it was seven times that He said that. But I can't remember right at the moment. As you, Yahweh, have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give everlasting life to all whom you have given him. 
Yahweh chose the people that would receive everlasting life because he already knew what was going to happen. Now, Rav Shaul agrees with what I've just said, that Yeshua holds the scepter. So when you say, well, Paul kind of did away with all of that stuff, I don't think so. Paul was an Orthodox Jew. Actually, he still is an Orthodox Jew, and his name wasn't Paul. It was Shaul. And he knew what was going on. In Ephesians 1.22, And he put all under his feet and gave him to be head over all. Again, Paul is saying this is the way things are. And in Hebrews 2, verse 8, essentially the same thing is being said. Therefore, Yeshua has a scepter of leadership. He possesses it. Yeshua is Yahweh's choice to be the leader over united Israel. Now, there's some real advantages to this. If we are believing Israel, we are believers in Yeshua, we are committed to being believers in Yeshua, understand? We are obedient to Yahweh's Torah because we are believers in Yeshua. Then when we pray in his name, in the king's name, you understand? When you pray, you are invoking that scepter of the king, the kingship of the king, to your prayer. What does that do for us? We have a serious problem as believers. What happened to all of the healings? There shouldn't be anybody sick in here. What are we doing wrong? We should be speaking something and literally turn the hearts of everybody out there to him. We should say some words and, and they just fall over because we have that power of that kingship that exists now. This is why I keep saying the kingdom is now. It started, he, he brought it. We as believing Israel have authority through the Messiah Yeshua, through his kingship, through the throne he's sitting on today over Hasatan, the adversary, also known as Satan. And we don't even use that power. I don't think we know how. I think sometimes we, we think we're supposed to be in some kind of trance or something or another, or, or somehow our, our, we're supposed to do some great things when I don't see anybody doing that. They were all peaceable about things. They didn't come and have bands and, and parades whenever they did something. They just spoke it. What well, do Yeshua healed a bunch of guys? I mean, look at it in the book. He heals a bunch of guys, and he just basically says, you're healed. No band, no parade, no waving flags or stuff like that. I'm beginning to wonder, and I really have for a long time, I bet he did a whole lot of this that never made it into the book. Why? He is the king of Israel. And we don't accept it. We let it, we kind of let it go. We don't, we don't grab hold of that power. I mean, Rick and I have been in a combat zone. We know power. We know weaponry. I was an artilleryman. You had authority. And I had authority. Under your commander. Why aren't we doing it today? Not just us. Why aren't you doing it up there, YouTube? What are we doing? Our faith, is weak. Our faith is weak. I don't know if it's that. Some of us have faith. You could, you, you really nuclear grade faith. But there's something wrong. We're not pulling that out. Is it strife between each each person? Is it 
Is it some of the things that we may be involved in secretly or openly? Are all these things, we're, we're looking for different things, and maybe all we have to do is just sit down and say, I believe in Yeshua. He's my king. We sing it. He's my king. And I want to exercise that authority. And I won't do it inappropriately. We have to be careful with the, our anger towards other people. Now, I'm, of course, I never have anger towards other people. <laughs> not, even, not even close. Yeah, right. I don't, uh, not even close. But we have authority over the Satan. We have, no, we have no excuse for allowing the things that are happening to us personally. Now, trying to convince one of our family members and then saying, oh, Jesus, please come down here and fix my daughter. No, no, there's another thing going on there. But you can pray against Satan's influence. And there's people in here that are knowing that, and Margaret and I are two of them that know it. We can pray against that, that, that thing. All right. Shalom. Hey, hello, everybody. Got a good turnout. Uh, last week, we talked about Vayaki, and I mentioned last week that I felt like the Lord told me three words, fullness of time, okay? And, uh, and we're kind of caught here. This is, what, December 29th between a time period called Christmas and New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. So I'm going to talk about that just a little bit because it seems appropriate. And uh, this, uh, in Galatians 4, 4, uh, does that, this Galatians 4 teaching by Paul does it have something to do with fullness of time? And I think it does. My question to you, are you Hebrew? I believe you would agree that you are. Are Christians Hebrew? Exactly. Maybe. Maybe not all Christians are Hebrew. The word Hebrew, uh, I think it originated from what I've studied with Eber and Abraham, and uh, it means one who crosses over. So uh, this Torah portion today about Exodus or names, uh, and, and, and including all the way to the end of Exodus, talks about who gets to cross over. And let me ask you something. They were all saved at Pentecost, I mean at, at Passover, right? They were all saved at Passover. But the ones who came out put the blood on the doorpost, right? <laughs> so they chose to be. So they were all saved at Passover. And I believe Christians, pretty much all of them, are saved at Passover. But can they lose their eternal life, salvation, whatever you want to call protection between Passover and Yom Kippur. I believe they can. Why? Why do I say that? It's about crossing over. See, and the church teaches pretty much what I've studied and heard is that the church, if you believe in Jesus, you're raptured. You're saved. You're raptured. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, and I want to say that that is not a rapture verse. It's a protection verse. See, the people that were saved at Passover, depending on how they responded to God's ways, how many crossed over? How many crossed over of that first generation? Two. Two entered the promised land, okay? So if we are in the fullness of time today, and as Christians, we're about to enter this messianic age, 
how many are going to cross over? Well, it depends on who you compare yourself to. If, you com if I would compare myself to, say, the person sitting next to me in the pew at most churches, I'm not saying every church, but at most churches, I'm raptured, I'm saved, I'm going to cross over, I'm going to be protected. But if you compare yourself to Moses, might get a different answer. That's what this Torah portion is about today. Moses did not get to cross over. He was saved, and yes, he shall receive eternal life, called the second resurrection, and he might actually be raised in the first. He will receive eternal life, but he did not get to enter the promised land. So hopefully you'll get some of the parallels that I share with you today. So what I want to ask you is, Christianity, what special days are you observing? I just said this is December 29th between Christmas and New Year's Day. So what special days are you observing? Let's see what Paul has to say about this. And I want to give you an example of how things can get twisted. This isn't Paul, but it's an example of how things can get twisted. I'm very ugly, so don't try to convince me that I'm a beautiful person because at the end of the day, I hate myself in every single way. I'm not going to lie to myself by saying there's beauty inside of me that matters. So rest assured, I will remind myself that I am worthless, terrible person, and nothing you say will make me believe I still deserve love because no matter what, I am not good enough to be loved and I am in no position to believe that. Beauty does not exist within me because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think, am I as ugly as people say? Eh, it's not a very good confession, is it? Let's read it backwards. As I, am I as ugly as people say? Because whenever I look in the mirror, I always think, beauty does exist within me. And I am in no position to believe that I am not good enough to be loved. Because no matter what, I still deserve love. And nothing you say will make me believe that I am worthless, terrible person. So rest assured, I will remind myself there is beauty inside of me that matters. And I am not going to lie to myself by saying I hate myself in every single way. Because at the end of the day, I am a very beautiful person. So don't try to convince me that. I'm very ugly. It's all in how you look at things. And see, Peter in 2 Peter said, be careful that you don't twist the words of Paul. Galatians 4, 9 and 10. Because I tried to draw parallels with what would Paul say today in this congregation to you maybe listening still. If you, I hope you're still there. Uh, Galatians 4, 9 to 10. Why do you Galatians, and he, they've just been saved, right? Uh, to believe in God, to believe in Jesus, because Paul taught Jesus, cause, so are they new Christians? In a way, they are. Why do you Galatians, new Christians, want to go back to a weak and useless religion of trying to get to heaven by obeying God's laws? You are trying to please God by observing special days and times. So, has the Living Bible Translation twisted the words of Paul? Did you just read that? Okay, let's read it from a different perspective. That's what most in Christianity believe. They believe if you obey God's laws, you're going back to a weak religion Huh. special days and times. Galatians 4, 4 through 10. Verse 4 says, In the fullness of time, Yahweh sent Yeshua. So hopefully you're going to get the comparison here that I'm trying to make, that if we're in the fullness of time again, could the same context here be happening today in the Christian church? And I'm saying 
definitely. Verse 8, when you Galatians or new Christians did not know God, you worshipped pagan gods. Verse 9 and 10, why now that you know God would you turn back to those pagan special days and times? Verse 11, have I, Paul, taught you in vain? So what are these pagan special days? Feast of Saturnalia to include Christmas, the tree, the door wreath. Now you can, you know, I want to say this, and I forget, and I may not say this exactly right, but I think it was Miss Sarah Palin, the governor of Alaska, that said you can put lipstick on a pig. But will it be beautiful? No, it's still going to be a pig. It's still going to be a pig. You can put lipstick on Christmas and New Year's Day. But is it still going to be pagan? It represents the grim reaper, father time, chaos. It all originated with Ham, Cush, Nimrod the mother of all living. And I'm not going to get into details there. This is from 1911. The Saturday Evening Post. Now, what do we have here? We got the Grim Reaper with a sickle. They used to sacrifice their babies to Moloch on this day. He's an instrument of death. So in Daniel 7, 25, it says, it's talking about the Antichrist spirit in the last days. It says he changes the times, the holy times to pagan times. Is that what Apostle Paul is talking about here? He's saying, don't you Galatians know I, I've taught you that you're to observe holy times, special days. There are actually 60 of them. Sabbaths of God and, and obey his dietary laws. Don't resort back to those pagan ways. And he would tell you it was the ones I just mentioned there. The, it says Exodus uh, 1, 1 through 5. And, uh, and I didn't get the connection last year, uh, Rabbi, about name. Exodus meaning names. But in this first event, called the Exodus, which goes from one to the end of Exodus. It's talking about names. Seventy that went down to Egypt that, that uh, swarmed to say five million. And then uh, they were supposed to get to the promised land, guess what, in three days. But they did a little golden calf thing. And what is that? Substituting your ways for God's ways. That's what they did. And so then they get to spend 40 years in the wilderness. I want to know, has anybody in here spent 40 years in the wilderness? I have. Because I was doing it my way instead of God's way. I'm ashamed to say, you know, I love Walt's prayer today. Uh, you know, Lord's going to come back one day and just clean us all up and... Uh, we all do the best we can. But, you know, it's because we are passionate for the Lord and we love him. So I, I drew a line with these pagan days because I did a little research and found out their origin. But uh, so see this exodus, you know, when we get to the half Torah, it's the prophet's commentary on this, the first five books, right? That's what the Haftarah is. And all in the Haftarah, all the prophets talk about a second exodus. What is that about? So what I want to share with you is it's about names. The second exodus is about names. Who is going to cross over into the promised land? I have a feeling everyone in here's name is already in that book. You're going to get to cross over because it's a rewards event and I believe you're going to cross over. But 
I think one of the most important verses I would like for you to know by heart is Isaiah 11:11. 11, 11. It says that Yahweh, I Yahweh, shall gather a remnant, not all of Christianity, not all the people who pray to God, that's Judah and Ephraim. In the last days, if you pray to Yahweh or Yeshua, that's Christianity and Judah, he's not going to save all of them. He's going to save a remnant. That's what Isaiah 11, 11 says. I will save a remnant a second time. This is what's knocking on the door. So when you get to the end of the teaching today, I won't discuss it, but uh, there's a timetable. And I've taught on this before because I believe it's knocking at the door. But what what's, goes on here in Exodus, you know, is the people, even though they're, they've got back-breaking work and Pharaoh's working them hard, they've been in Egypt a long time. They're kind of used to the way things are. They're... They're kind of okay, you know. Uh, Moses comes along and says, hey, Yahweh wants to deliver you from all this because you've been praying. You want to be delivered. But to actually put the blood on the doorpost and to do what Yahweh wanted them to do, they might have said, well, you know, it's okay. I'm okay. You know, I'll just keep on working. So there's some extra biblical stuff there from the book of Jasher, which is mentioned several times in the Bible. In the Bible, and whether it's the real book or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just some interesting commentary there that they believe, and they reference sages and people. They believe that uh, the these plagues weren't just for the Egyptians; it was to make the people a little uncomfortable where they were, so they would want to get out of Egypt. Okay, so if that's true, and that happened in the first. Exodus, could it happen in the second Exodus? God's people, Judah and Christianity, may be made uncomfortable because, you know, I, a lot of friends and family I know, they're not going to do Saturday Sabbath. They like it just the way it is. But if God says, okay, I think I'm going to make it a little uncomfortable, if he does that in our lifetime, I know he's going to do it. I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime. I have a feeling it is. So they say here, the sages, some of the sages say that God had to make them uncomfortable for them to want to do the Sabbath. Uh, Exodus 3, 1. Moses was pasturing the flocks of Jethro at the mountain of Horeb, or Mount Sinai. It says in several places that Mount Horeb is in Arabia. Well, what is Arabia here? Saudi Arabia. The name still hasn't changed. It's still Saudi Arabia, Arabia. And it's near a land called Midian. I have sheep. Okay, to get sheep to follow you to, say, new pasture, it's not that easy. You've got to have a stick, and you've got to beat them over the head. So when they go all the way down to the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula, where this thing is up there that they say that that's where Mount Horeb is in the southern peninsula of Sinai, Sinai Peninsula where it's very mountainous you got to get those sheep from from uh, where Midian is in, and they know Midian's in Saudi Arabia from there to this mountain you know that many people believe this that Sinai or Horeb is in Saudi Arabia even uh, pictures and stuff anyway so verse 2 so an angel, this is Hebrew word 4397, appears in a burning bush, and the bush did not burn up. And I say, this is for my studies, that this is the year 1383 B.C. Exactly seven jubilee cycles later, and I've taught on what a jubilee cycle is, it's 49 years, and then the year 50, which is the Jubilee year, begins year one of the next cycle to 49. And then year 50, and then you start all again. At year 50 is also year one. Okay, so that comes out to the exact number of days from 1383 B.C., the burning bush event, 
to when King David was born, 1040 B.C. Now, this uh, to, for me to print this uh, verse here and say that, I'm just telling you, took hundreds and hundreds of hours to figure that out. And I could be wrong. <laughs> okay, I could be wrong. So, uh, see the burning bush event to King David at, uh, and the Jebusites. Because, you know, King David took the th bought the threshing floor from the Jebusites. And, uh, uh, and that's where the temple was built. So, Hebrew 43.97 is malach, meaning angel, messenger, representative, theophonic entity. Angels, because haven't you wondered sometimes who this guy was that was talking to Abraham, who this guy was that was talking to Lot, you know, visited his house, you know, in Sodom and Gomorrah, kind of what they were. You know, we kind of know they're angels, messengers, but what are we talking about here? Angels appeared to Adam, Eve, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Hagar. Remember, the angel told Hagar, your son's not going to die. You're going to be okay. I'm going to make him into a great nation. Lot, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Balaam, remember, angel, got the donkey to talk. Gideon, Samson's mother, King David, Elijah, Isaiah, Amos, Jeremiah, Zechariah, I'd say angels appear to all the prophets. These angels can look and act like men. And remember the story after the resurrection when Yeshua was sitting on the 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 beat the co the 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 shore, and uh, he cooked a meal with uh, uh, cooked some fish, and said, "Peter, come eat." And then Peter said, "Well, are you angry at me because I said I denied you three times?" He said, "Oh no, feed my sheep." Anyway, he looked like a man. He in a re he was resurrected at that time. Okay, these angels can look and act like men. Did this angel in the burning bush look like a man or a god? Could it have been Yahweh or Yeshua? Theophany, this is the word, is a manifestation of God that is tangible to the human senses. In its most restrictive sense, it is a visible appearance of God in the Old Testament period often, but not always, in human form. Some would also include this term, same term as Christophany, which means the pre-incarnate appearance of Yeshua. So my question is, who was at the burning bush? I don't know. It says Yahweh. It says an angel. So something to think about there, I think. I think it's very interesting. Could it have been Yeshua? In this, because he said he's, his spirit is from the foundation of the earth. And then verse 3, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this phenomenon. And I put him there. Uh, my, my thought about that, because the Lord has told me this. He's told me, Larry, slow down. He told me this in 2004. And I tend to not slow down, you know. But believe me, I have slowed down a lot. But if you don't slow down sometimes... Will you miss the supernatural? And say, if God's about to take his people in the second exodus, he says, I'm going to perform a lot of supernatural events. Don't you want to be in on it and help him? I think we all have a place there to, do, to help him. He's, he used people in the first exodus. He's going to use you and me in the second exodus. Okay? Verse 4. Yahweh said, and it says Yahweh here, said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Verse 8 to 9 says, I have descended from heaven. And I'm saying this is to start this exodus, this first exodus. And uh, I believe he'll do it again in the second exodus. I believe this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. It says there be a shout and the voice of God and he will descend from heaven. Okay. And we who are alive will be caught up into the cloud. That's protection. Just like the first Exodus, they were caught up into a cloud 
on earth. Okay. Verse 10. I, Yahweh, shall send you, Moses, a decree to take my children of Israel out of Egypt. So this is where, this is references Daniel 9, 25. And uh, this is where I start counting the seven jubilees. It's not the, uh, yes, Yahweh can use pagan kings like Cyrus. He did use Cyrus. But his command was to Moses to go get the people. And what did they do? They were, he, he says, I want to return them to the land. When they crossed the Jordan years later, 40 years later, they don't, didn't have the temple built then. David had to buy the th threshing floor. They had to build the temple. And they built that on the site, that many sages say, where Shem had his Torah school who taught Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I'm going to return you to Israel, okay, to Jerusalem. Moses said, who am I to lead God's people? See, I believe that Ed and Rick and Rabbi and all you in here uh, can lead and help. Just like most, you, you, but you would say, you would have a tendency to say, who am I, Yahweh, to help the people? Who am I? And, uh, but I think he's saying the same thing to us. And later in Exodus 4, and I want to go ahead and read this there. It says, Moses said the people will not believe him. And Yahweh said, Moses, because they don't believe us sometimes, do they? <laughs> okay. What's in your hand? I think the Lord's going to use something that we already have. I'm not sure what it is to bring them in, okay? And then I guess I, I'll, I'll close with this because I do want to do a little Bill Cloud. Exodus 3, 13 to 15. If the children of Israel ask your name, what shall I say? This is Moses talking to God. I will be what I will be. Say, Yahweh, the great I am, has sent you. This is my name forever. And then you can read some of those other scriptures there. Yahweh is the noun form of that word, aye, E-H-Y-E-H, aye. Aye in Hebrew means I was, I am, I will be. Okay? That's the verb form. So we should know Yahweh's name. It's a great outreach tool. I've used it many times. Uh, uh, and uh, when, I, when I'm talking to people, I'll say, do you know God's name? And they'll say, well, uh, no, Lord. You know, it's a good outreach. And they want to know his name. So, but you'd be surprised uh, that people do want to know his name. You need a blessing. Receive the name. Yivareka ka Yahweh v'ishmareka. Yair Yahweh panavalecha v'ikuneka. Yisa Yahweh panavalecha v'yasem lacha shalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you all and give you his shalom. Shabbat Shalom, and let us not forget, Baruch Haba B'Shem Yahweh, or blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yahweh. Now, anybody that wants extra special prayer, this is a good time for it. You can come on up front. Pastor Don, Elder Don can pray for you. Thank you.